Shane, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? <laughs> uh, let's see here. You, you wrote it down for me. Um, <laughs> this, this is the answer, isn't it? Yeah, so this is episode 42 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. And in, in the wonderful world of Douglas Adams, 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Did you ever read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No, I, I never did. Uh, I heard about it. I think everybody's heard about it. Uh, it I just never did. I don't know. I, I probably should. When I was in grade seven, which is kind of when you're old enough to make your own decisions about your homework, but still too young to make the best decisions, perhaps. Um, I had an English teacher and in the back of the classroom, he had like this this old kind of bookshelf that was like falling apart and like so many books on it. It was just like a total mess. And my friends and I, we kind of took that as like our corner in the classroom. And one of my friends leaned back, we had to do book reports. And he said, you can do a book report on anything on the bookshelf. But I don't think that he knew exactly what was on that bookshelf. And one of my <laughs> friends picked up, I forget what it was. It was like, it was like a Charlie Brown book or something like that. And so he did his book report on that, but he did like a good job. This guy's now a Bay Street lawyer. Um, and, and so I wasn't even trying to be creative. And I, and I kind of walked back and went, oh man, I need something. I'm kind of like, I think I had left it very late. And I saw this book lying there and on the back cover, it said, don't panic. And I'm like, that's the book for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that I read it. And uh, anyway. It's the, it's the best trilogy in five books anybody can, can ever pick up, <laughs> in my opinion. All right. But it was great to see you last week or this past week. We went out for, I guess it is last week now, we went out for, uh, tried to do uh, an observing session. <laughs> that didn't yeah, work. my heart was broken. I was so excited. I, I was looking forward to that, like to doing some, you know, dark Dark sky, dark-ish sky observing mm -hmm. uh, with another human being, um, but to no avail. Yeah, we had, yeah, that was, I think, a very unpleasant evening. Not, it was extremely hot. I think, what was it when we went out? Like, it was still 34 or 35? Yeah, yeah, and that was at uh, sunset. You know, that was around 830. Yeah, so I don't know what that is, but it's probably around 100 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. It had been at least 105 Fahrenheit that day here in Regina, I think, whatever that is, it was very, very hot. And then out there, it was also dusty, cloudy, yeah. Yeah. and clouds well, and mosquitoes. And, and yeah, and, and the clouds in the sky were very strange. Like the forecast, the entire day was clear skies um, and clear skies for the evening. And then yeah. I, you know, I think I had supper. Yeah, I looked outside and, and I think either you texted or called just about at that exact moment to say, yeah, eh, I'm not sure it's looking so good out there. Well, yeah, because this place is only like, like, if, you know, and I drive much slower than you. I think for me, it's an eight minute drive from my house. For you, it's probably half that time. Um, but it's pretty close to my place. So I'm kind of, I don't have a lot of skin in this game and you're, you have to drive across the city. It's probably take you the better part of 15 or 20 minutes to, to get to my place uh, or that side anyway. And uh I was like, oh man, I don't want Shane arriving here. And then he's like, why'd you drag me all the way over here? You got clouds on this side of the city, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was clouds everywhere. Um, yeah, by the time it you really was a, a pretty awful night. Although what's strange is uh, I took my dog out around 1030 to go yeah. to, to use the facilities before we went to bed. And, uh, you know, it was clear, like we could have observed it probably that time, but, you know, that how, do you, how do you know? Yeah. Well, and our plan was to go and set up the scopes, let them cool down. You know, a telescope uh, needs a little while to acclimate to the outside temperature. In this case, they'd be warming up <laughs> because it's cooler in our houses. Yeah. And, uh, and then do some planetary observing. That was the plan. And then um, do some deep sky observing as well and just kind of check that site out. But uh, yeah, but I, I went home and I actually set up and observed Saturn and Jupiter uh, at 1030 or quarter to 11. And it was the, the clouds cleared from west to east. So it probably wasn't fully until uh, really close to 11 o'clock that we would have had, you know, decent skies at that yeah, site, it's yeah. even further uh, east than my house. So, oh, well. Oh, well, we'll try again. Yeah. Did you get any observing in at all this past week, Shane? 
I did. I had uh, a, a daytime session and a nighttime session. What? But you can't see any stars during the day. Oh, well, there's one bright one I could see. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but don't look straight at it because you'll go blind. So. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, yeah, so actually, I'll start with that one. That was just this morning. Oh. Um, woke up with the dog at about 6.30, 7 o'clock. It was beautiful outside, so took my cup of coffee out. Took my Hydrogen Alpha Lunt telescope, which is uh, just a little 35 millimeter. It's, it's quite small, but uh, we've talked about it on other episodes. It's got a special filter for viewing the sun that only allows a, a very narrow wavelength of light and, and only allows like 0.0, I don't even know, maybe 0.01% of the light to come through. Uh, it takes a lot of it out, so it's very safe. Um, and with a hydrogen alpha filter, you can see surface detail that you can't see any other way on our sun, it's but you amazing. can also, yeah, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. It's wild. You can also see prominences. So prominences look like little flares coming off the edge of the sun or the limb of the sun. And, um, one of the things that I wanted to do today was test those, uh, TMB super monocentric eyepieces, uh, that I've been collecting here over the summer. Um, just to see how they do on hydrogen alpha. Um, cause what I've noticed in the past is, uh, complex eyepieces with multiple elements really do impact the view of the sun, probably more so than nighttime astronomy. Hmm. Um, so, I wonder why that is. well, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure if it's just because the level of like contrast or sharpness, uh, maybe more of the sharpness uh, that's required on the sun to to see some of these details and have them appear quite nice. Um, you know, it's very finicky, you know, so if you have any degradation, whether it's seeing or you're mm. within your optics, you're going to notice it very quickly. Huh. Interesting. So um, the TMBs are very simple eyepieces. So yeah, I wanted to see how well they do. So how well did they do? Quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, so what I've typically used with my hydrogen alpha is I have this, uh, Nikon, I think it's like the MC two zoom. Uh, the focal range is nine millimeter to 21 millimeter. Yeah. It's a weird eyepiece because it, it's made for a spotting telescope. Um, so to make it work for like a regular astronomy telescope, you have to wrap some duct tape around the barrel um, and then that gets it up to almost the size of a, a point zero or sorry, a 0.965 inch eyepiece. Yeah. So then I put the 965 to one and a quarter inch adapter on it and then I can use it uh, like a regular eyepiece. Yeah. Your, your, and your DIY skills, by the way, are a little bit better than the, the average person, I think, because <laughs> you've DIY'd me some stuff. Like I was looking at, I was, I was showing, you know, that uh, it's like a, it's like a binocular to tripod adapter. Oh, that wood block thing. The wood block. And, yeah. you know, you can buy those for 50 or $80 or something. And I think this is better than the ones that you can buy. I've used that a whole pile of times. Eh? Like, I love it. It's yeah. like the greatest thing. And it looks, it just looks, you know, I, I think you should create like a monogram that you can put on the stuff <laughs> that you make. And then like those binoculars that, that you made with the 3D printer, like they look like, like all this stuff, it sort of has a sort of homegrown element, but it really, it, it very much, they all sort of have like a prototype kind of stage. Like it's not, you know, you, you haven't like sanded things down and kind of, you know, really pretty them up. But as far as the usability, it, they're perfect stuff. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. I, I, I enjoy tinkering and, and sometimes it, the, uh, the end result is just a case of stubbornness <laughs> and, and sheer determination. But yeah, well, you're, you know. you're definitely uh, more skilled in these, these sort of arts than I am for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so with this Nikon zoom, I I've always used it because one of the things with um, uh, H alpha viewing of the sun is you're constantly battling the seeing conditions. Um, you know, the, as things heat up during the day, seeing just gets worse and worse. So you're constantly going up and down the magnification scale, depending on how good the seeing is at that time. Um, and uh, anyway, the, the Nikon zoom's always been really good. It's, it's kind of a sleeper eyepiece in astronomy. Yeah, I've uh, heard of you, it. I, I've never, I almost, well, at some point I would like to borrow it from you now that. Yeah, you know, yeah, you should. Return to the original position and you pride 
the Nikon from my cold hands. Yes, yes, I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should borrow this. It is, um, of all the zooms that I've looked through, and I've, I've looked through a handful, um, this is one of the sharpest ones out there. Um, okay. Now, it doesn't get the same fanfare that the Leica gets because the Nikon has, um, oh, gee, I think the field of view is very similar to an ortho or a plossal. Like, it's in that 40 to 50 degree range. Yeah. So I've heard well, good things, though. Like, I've heard really good things. Pe- people on cloudy nights, and, and I can vouch for this, uh, you know, talk about how this zoom even presents a very ortho-like image like it's very very sharp uh, despite all the elements and the fact that it's a zoom it's tiny it's very light if you want the ultimate grab and go eyepiece this is it um now you're sacrificing the wide field views the yeah. eye relief actually isn't too bad um as far as you know kind of that ortho type of eyepiece goes um it's fantastic and like i think you can buy this thing for around i think it's under 350 dollars canadian Mm-hmm. for something that good and the fact that it you know it gives you that focal range from nine millimeter to 21 millimeter you're almost buying like a whole set of eyepieces in this one eyepiece um, yeah the, re- the reason why i really want to try it is that it, it's difficult to determine if i'll be able to look through it with my glasses on like sometimes like i feel like i can get in pretty close yeah. to to a lot of optics and i i would just like to try it before i before i ever uh laid down the money for it but uh Anyway, I, there's so many eyepieces I'd like to try and buy, but you know, I'd be happy. You know, it's funny we're gonna we're gonna tie this together pretty good because I have a zoom, but it it needs a small fix. And, oh, is this your Antares? Yeah, my Antares. It's just it's just jammed, but I have never been able to unjam it. So mm. send um, it my way. I'll do I'll do the surgery. <laughs> so we we could trade off, and then and that is a uh, so I don't know if you've ever looked through one of those, but no, I haven't. Speaking of unrefined, but optically, uh, you know, great, excellent performance is it's a zoom that runs five millimeters to nine millimeters. Hmm. That's an interesting which, range. Which is a very interesting range because that gives you like sort of medium to really like low end high power. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, like for example, in my, in my uh, 100 millimeter, this would give you... Um, something like 80 odd power to uh close to 150 power which that would <laughs> that would suffice yeah. for many things on many nights and Absolutely. Uh, it's sharp and it's very wide i think it's it's either i want to say it's 80 degrees but i actually think it's wider i think it's more like 85 point something degrees throughout so wow. it's it's That's among incredible. the widest now it has it has a bit of secondary color but Right now it's stuck at the nine millimeter setting or close to it. And, uh, and it, uh, when it extends out though, boy, if you ever thought that you had uh, a long uh, finagly eyepiece when you stacked a Barlow and a Barlow and an extension tube before, uh, then you ain't seen nothing yet. Cause this thing, I think when it's fully extended, it's got to be close to a foot, you know, Holy smokes. but wow. it's, it's very light. It's very lightweight. Um, and it works, you know, uh, it, it does the trick. It's, uh, you kind of back the screw off and then you, then you slide it. But the thing that I found is this, and this, this is sort of the limiting thing. I, I keep it around because well, it's, it's jammed. And then, uh, I don't know, it's just such a weird eyepiece that I just can't let it go. And if I sold it, I'd probably never find one again. Um, they're pretty, they're pretty rare. Yeah. But I found that what I would do is. I would find the object in my low power because I don't have a tr- any tracking mounts yet. I still have that one on the way. And, uh, and then I put it in at the nine millimeter setting and then I would just zoom it out to five. So I'd go right from, you know, the, the lowest power that it yeah. offered to the highest power. Um, and, and that was, that was how I, I viewed with it. But you know, I don't know. I, I kind of want to try it out again. It would be awesome to, uh, to get it running. So I was also using telescopes that uh, I was using it a lot in my 80 millimeter. And then I never, I don't think I ever used it or if I did, it was very limited in my five inch. And I'm not sure why I never used it in my five inch uh, power mount when I bought it. I think cause I bought some Pentax XWs. In. Yeah, I was going to say you, you became a Pentax snob. So <laughs> then it was all over for the Antares. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Although I, I really do like the Antares as far as like, a budget um, friendly 
um, quality optic that, I mean, and Glenn, I was talking to him this past summer, he's got more now and they look more refined. I mean, in fact, they, although he's, he's using like black and green, they're, they're almost reminiscent of, of another company that uses black uh, barrels with green writing. Um, well, they, they also remind me of the Morpheus line too. Yeah, it's sort of like a like a mixed bag in between, but uh, you know, I think they're eighty six degrees or something. But they're not great for eyeglass wearers. But uh, yeah, you no, know, I don't know. Like, I, I really like the original Spears Wilder line. I you know, and even though I need glasses and, and more and more need needed glasses to observe, or came to that realization, you know, I I think they're nice optics. Um, they are. Yeah. What I've I've bought and sold so many eyepieces, I've lost count, but. Uh, very few I regret getting rid of. The, those Ann Terry's, uh, Spears Waller, I, I do regret getting rid of those because I think I had them all at one point. And uh, they're a nice eyepiece. They were great for eyeglass wearers. And that field of view was so wonderful. Yeah, I think, I think really, and I wish he still made them, was that the 70 or 72 or 73 or 75 is the weird number. Um, I think that was the pinnacle. I think those were the ones. Because I had some of those... And I could use my glasses because I think they had 14 millimeters of true eye relief. And it was, for me, I don't need quite as much. Like the Pentax have 20 and sometimes I do have a little bit of black because I don't need as much eye relief. My eyes aren't too deeply set and my glasses are very thin. I don't have, have really big prescriptions or anything. So I found like the 14 or 15 millimeters of eye relief on those 72s or whatever they were was perfect. But then when I went to the 80s, um, they were about 12 and it was, it was a little too tight. I think I was only getting about 70 degrees anyway. So I was only getting the benefit of, of the slightly, uh, the slightly newer, uh, optics and, you know, anyway, anywho. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, um, any other gear well, or observing updates from you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just finish off the solar observing because there's one thing that was really cool this morning. Um, there was a, a very active prominence, um, right almost right at the solar or uh, southern pole of the of the sun, uh, right at the bottom of it. Uh, it became very bright. So this is, again, a prominence is like a flare, kind of looks like a flamey thing coming mm-hmm. off the sun. Most of these things are fairly static looking. Like they, they're there um, and they do evolve, but usually it's over, like you kind of have to look at them over the course of a few hours to see mm-hmm. changes. Some of them will be a little bit quicker than that. Well, this one completely transformed in about 20 minutes. Like it grew, wow. it brightened, then it, it, it kept kind of detaching itself from the sun. Then it started to fade and just completely disappeared. Huh. Um, so that was really neat to see. I've, uh, I can't count too many of those in all of my solar observing that I've done. That mm. was, uh, so that was fun. Cool. Um, and then the nighttime observing. So earlier in the week, I had the Takahashi 76 DCUQ out. Um, and that was, what was that now? Wednesday night or Thursday night? I can't remember. Uh, seeing wasn't the Wednesday. best. Thursday yeah. was. You weren't out Thursday night. Trust me. Uh, you know what? I think, yeah, you're mm-hmm. right. It was Wednesday. It oh, was you Wednesday. Could, it, yeah. That was when that big storm rolled through. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. <laughs> um so Wednesday night, though, the seeing was so-so, and there was clouds everywhere. But like the, the bank of the clouds to the south, the edge of them was just kind of skirting Saturn and Jupiter. So you'd see yeah. Jupiter and Saturn hmm. for about 10 minutes, and then the cloud would cover them, and then the cloud would move, and then you could see the planets again. That cloud um, was right over my house because I, yeah. <laughs> I was completely blocked. <laughs> well, I, I, I was really north. determined. I yeah. could see the north. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very determined because I had just received some new, uh, well, new to me, uh, TMB Super Monos. Uh, I had the 10 millimeter, the eight, the six, and the 1.8 times Barlow arrive. So I really wanted to get out and try them. Um, and the, the 10 millimeter TMB gave me the best view of Jupiter I've ever had with this telescope. Oh, now, wow. You know, I've only had this telescope for what, four or five months. So uh, that's not saying a lot, although I have you, probably you observed have Jupiter, yeah. you know, 15 to 20 times at least already. Yeah. Um, like the equatorial bands were just so like, so sharp and, and the color was, was, um, you know, an obvious brown, you know, hmm. uh, there's a lot of modeling and irregularity. Uh, the great red spot just 
like the separation between the red spot and, and its equatorial band was very easy to see. Hmm. And it just, the color was richer, you know, like a pinky salmon blotch. Um, the polar regions were visible, which wow. you know, so far this year, I haven't been able to see them too much, if at all. And yeah. in fact, I don't recall any of them in my observations, but they were there. Now, yeah. and like I say, I don't think the seeing was anything special that night. Um, and I was even glimpsing the northern temperate belt, um, mm. which again is a, that's a challenging observation, especially with a three inch telescope. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was incredible. Um, so then I moved on to Saturn. Uh, Cassini division was no problem. Um, I could easily see the equatorial zone, uh, the northern equatorial belt, and Saturn's shadow that it casts onto the rings that go behind it. Yeah. Um, it was, Love it was that. outstanding. And yeah. um, I, it was a fun session, but the clouds just got the best of me. I got frustrated dodging them. So yeah. I said, enough's enough. And I went in. Yeah. Has to be fun. Has to stay fun. Yeah. So that was my week. How about you? I know wow. you, I, you were out a lot. Um, and, and maybe before you get into it, I just want to say, I'm super happy to see you're using that five millimeter XO. Um, <laughs> that, that needs to see light. So I'm happy it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So I've, I've been observing Mars and you know, it, Mars is challenging to observe. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that first. Um, and it was the very first thing that I, that I ever pointed a telescope that I, that I purchased because uh, Mars was near uh, opposition, but I forget what year it was, 96 or 97. I bought a telescope and Mars was uh, coming into opposition or coming out of opposition. I think it had a dust storm on it or something. And uh, anyway, uh, it, it was cloudy, of course, because I'm from the Maritimes and it's cloudy there much of the time. And, but I could just barely see Mars through the clouds. So it just, that, that just ended up being the thing that I, that I looked at. And I think I could just barely make out like sort of the Sirtis major region or something like that, which kind of looks like Africa um, on the surface of Mars and maybe a polar cap or a polar hood. And I was just blown away. So I've kind of always been a Mars observer longer than anything else, but I learned very quickly, like if you're going to run a Mars campaign of observing, that's in a way, that's kind of what you're observing. Everything else is a little bit secondary, like whether it's going to dark skies and deep sky observing or what, because the, the good times for observing Mars, like you, you're more, um, I guess, committed to the transparency and the seeing conditions than the darkness uh, and getting out in the evening. So like if, for example, if, if we had done our session on Tuesday, I wouldn't have done the sketching on Wednesday morning because it's very difficult to stay up uh, observing and then go to bed and then, and then get up and observe, especially after you've kind of been out running the back roads um, and, and, you know, hauling gear in and out of vehicles and stuff like that. So, yeah, for sure. But Mars right now sort of tell people where it is. Mars is, is just about overhead uh, at about 3 a.m. right now. And that, that would, should sort of hold true no matter where you are. And uh, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. And then it appears like a really bright uh, orange ember. Uh, when I was a kid, and the first time I, I sort of knew more or less what I was looking at, I was about six. And uh, I thought it kind of looked like a goldfish color almost like a dark yeah, uh, that's a good description yeah sort of like a dark orangey goldfish color you like the classic goldfish um but mars is coming towards opposition i think at some point we should do a, a deep dive uh into mars but uh right now it seems like every day or at least every week it's just getting bigger and bigger like now it's looking better through my 60 millimeter than it did the last time I had my 100 millimeter out on it a, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, you can see lots of the dark surface features through, and this is a very small telescope. Like my 60 millimeter is basically about as small a, a telescope as you can get. And you know, people listening may have any sort of telescope and that, that's any telescope really now with any kind of power uh, approaching uh, you know, 50 or 60 power is going to start to to reveal some surface features like last night i was looking at it at 60 power uh and i could see lots of surface details at 60 power so it's it's really starting to come along and right now the the uh you'll see some dark surface features you can see the deserts and uh the south polar cap has has receded 
but it's pointed towards us. Uh, and you can see it kind of sitting out like a, like a very bright white island in this orange desert, which is amazing. And then to the north, if, if you get really good moments of really good scene, you're using like 115 or 125 power, you can actually see the northern polar cap just barely peeking over the horizon. And what we're seeing here is we're actually seeing sort of that uh, late spring, early summer season uh, for the southern hemisphere uh, on Mars, which is really cool. Like you can actually uh, stand out there, uh, you know, on Earth. Here we are and there's, there's lots going on in the world these days. Um, but you can actually watch uh, the seasons happening uh, on another planet, which is just astounding to me. And you can see um, that the polar uh, cap in the south, or at least I kings I've been watching it now for, for a couple months, uh, it's now receding. Like before, I couldn't, it didn't look detached because it was extending so far around that it, you know, that it basically touched the, the uh, horizon that, that I can see uh, you know, uh, on the other side, which I'm not sure what direction that is, but it, but it just basically looked like a polar cap covering the whole pole. But now it's kind of sitting out because that pole is tilted towards us, just like our, our poles will tilt towards the sun during their spring or summer. Um, it kind of, it's just sitting out there in the sunlight, you know, for, for that part of Mars all Martian day, right? But then the north, um, it's pointed away from the sun right now. And, and as such, pointed away from the Earth too, so that um, you're just lucky to see any. And it's just probably basically as winter is is in full force there, um, more snow in that is accumulating. So it may not even be the polar cap so much as just snow or frost, uh, sort of creeping, uh, you know, further further south, but still very very far into uh, into the uh, Martian uh, North Polar region. So that's pretty fascinating to be able to watch here from Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And, and I've, you know, one of the things I love in any of uh, any observation that's possible is seeing something change almost in front of your eyes, or over the course of say multiple nights, or, mm. or, or you know, with the sun over a couple of hours. Um, so, you know, I've talked about that, fl or the prominence that I saw earlier today. Mars is a great example. We've talked about Jupiter, like watching the moon's transit uh, the planet or, or go behind it. Any of that kind of stuff, I just find fascinating. Yeah. You know, I can see it through a telescope. And you don't need, like the really cool part about this um, is you don't need like a really big telescope for, for any of this stuff. Like I'm using, like I said, pretty much more or less. You can buy 50 millimeter or smaller telescopes, but typically any telescope that you're going to buy from any sort of reputable telescope store is going to start at about 60 millimeters. So, um, you know, I, I'm using as small a telescope. I'm not using like a big fancy telescope, although this is a small, reasonably fancy telescope. But, you know, I know you've used some some vintage uh, 60 millimeter telescopes. Yeah. And I, I think my observations are probably in line with with what you've seen through uh, through those super, super old uh, 55 or 60 millimeter telescopes. Yeah, I was just going to to bring that up that at last opposition two years ago, um, it, it was a disappointing opposition because Mars That's was smart. basically involved engulfed in a dust storm. So there was yeah. no detail really to see. However, um, as it was already like it was well past opposition. So, you know, it's now getting further away from Earth. Um, the dust storm subsided and I, I had a, a Tasco 7TE5, which is a very well-regarded and somewhat common uh, classic telescope. Um, it was produced in the 60s primarily. And um, uh, I thought I would, uh, I, I would try that on Mars to see what I could see. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest, I thought I would not see a lot. Uh, I was out observing, I don't even know what I was observing that night and Mars was up. So that's why I thought I'd swing it over to Mars. Because um, I just thought a 60 millimeter is too small to really... Uh, see anything on Mars. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. You know, I, I pointed it, I could see the, the caps, uh, you know, some of the surface detail. I couldn't believe it. Um, yeah. So, you know, and there's a telescope that you can find on eBay or like Craigslist or, you know, pick your used site, uh, you know, that goes for like $200 um, yeah. sometimes. So there's a, a fantastic telescope that will show you all kinds of detail, not just on Mars, but, you know, the other planets and, and moon as well. So a, a used TASCO 75. 7TE5. 17E5. 7? 7? T is in Tom. Oh. T is in Edward. 
dash five. <laughs> yeah, this is where my maritime ear comes comes into play. Um, boy, you should see how Siri interprets my speech. It's it's pretty hilarious. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Venus. I I've been making some observations of Venus. Um, so right now you can find Venus in the east, and it rises a little bit after midnight. Um, and by sunrise, it's super high up. It's about 45 or 50 degrees high right now. It's just really high in the sky while the sun is rising, at least for me here in, in Saskatchewan. I think if you're further south, it wouldn't be quite as high. Um, and it's basically the brightest quote unquote star uh, in the nighttime sky at this time. Um, and you'll see, you need a telescope to see it, but you'll need a, a little telescope to see that it's actually at a 50% phase or like a half moon. Um, there this morning. So it's just a perfect. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very cool. Um, and I can also see clouds on Venus. Now this is sort of more advanced stuff. It, it takes some, uh, some skill and, and experience, but you can eventually see clouds, uh, but they are calming down. So I think, I think if I, if I hadn't been doing a lot of Venus observing this year, I probably wouldn't even say I was seeing clouds. Um, and my seeing recently has been atrocious um, because it's uh, it's in the east and they're doing as you, as you know and we were just east of of my place the other day and they're out there harvesting and I think it's to the point now where they're tilling the soil or something and it's it's super turbulent in that direction which is strange because overhead when I'm observing Mars and I'm using um, like 115 to 170 power. Um, I get no problems. It's great. Uh, but then Venus to, to the east, although it's, it's a fair bit lower, um, the seeing at, at times, like the past couple mornings, I, I haven't even bothered trying to sketch it because it's just a blurry mess, um, which is not uncommon for Venus. But uh, anyhow, so, so those are my observations. Uh, regarding the eyepieces, yes, I'm using the XO, the 5.1 millimeter XO. Um, I can use it with my glasses on, which is great because my astigmatism is so bad, even at, at high power, it, it does impact my views. Um, but the problem uh, that, I, that I do have with that eyepiece is that without a tracking mount, um, it's very difficult to sketch using it. So I tried to sketch this morning with it and I kind of got frustrated and gave up. Um, yeah, yeah, that, of, that's understandable. Yeah, it's just, you know, with the with the Pentax XWs at three and a half millimeter, giving me 171 power, the field is easy to get my eye on, the field is really big, and I can kind of keep the scope tracking line pretty easy at 171 power, um, whereas the, the 5.1 XO is giving me 115 power. Um, now, the view is spectacular. It's definitely the best view. Um, but it's really hard. Like I start sketching and then I go back to the eyepiece and then I can't find it. Like I can't find Mars. So sometimes I was like switching out eyepieces just to find it and put it back in. And I did get a sketch off, but, uh, it, it does show remarkable detail, but it's almost like, yeah, I don't know. I might, even when I get a tracking mount, the field is so small. I might have to put like a finder on the telescope with some medium power and then use that to kind of keep centering it and then keep observing because I, I think even at uh, 150 power it, it will it will not be long for the for the middle of the field but yeah it's it's good I, I do really like that eyepiece and I was yeah thinking a few things but uh, that's yeah that's sort of my observing but Shane you you uh, have something to add about uh, digging for gold on the moon or something <laughs> yes, X marks the spot this week. Um, so there's a, a neat feature that people can see on the moon. Um, and th the funny thing about this is it's not really like a, a, like a crater feature or anything like that. It's a kind of an optical illusion. Um, and it's known as the Lunar X, or sometimes it's referred to as uh, the Werner X. Werner, yeah. And and it occurs a few times throughout the year. And what it is, so it's, um, uh, it, it, it's right along the terminator of the moon. And the sun catches uh, some peaks of like, uh, oh gee, it's some crater. Uh, the Eukert crater, I think, maybe? Oh, no, that's, uh, that's the lunar V. Anyway, it doesn't really, oh, the rim of the 
Blank, oh gee, I'm going to butcher these names. Whew. The Blanchius, <laughs> Blan- Blanchinus. So, yeah, the, the sounds good to forms- me. I, I'm, not, I'm not that much of a lunar observer, so yeah. So, so you can see the letter X, and it's formed on the rim of the Blanchius, the Cali, and Purbach craters, and and so these craters are basically in darkness, uh, but. The sun just catches the peaks at the right time. And then you see this X kind of glowing in the darkness. And it's kind of a cool thing to see. Um, And like I said, you can only see it a few times throughout the year. And sometimes the timing sucks. Like it's three in the morning or something like that. And only Chris wakes up at that time to go out observing. That's prime (laughs) observing time. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is for some. (laughs) Um, so this week, uh, August 25th in the evening, um, at, let me pull up the time. I think it's like 825, uh, 8.54 PM. So this is Eastern standard time. It lasts for a while though. Like it's, it's a many hours long event. So this would be like a North American event. Uh, pretty much if the moon is up for you on, and and it's, it's, it's in the evening sky, right? It is in the evening sky. Yeah, and it'll be up, you know, I think you could probably see it for a couple of hours on either side yeah. of 54. So, you know, from 7 p.m. until probably um, 11 p.m., you'll probably yeah. see it. So if you have uh, a telescope, and I think you probably would see it if you have, um, you know, probably 10 to 15 times power binoculars, I'm guessing, uh, you should be able to see it. And if you're out and you, you do locate the X, so the X will be right along the Terminator that night. Um, if you look above that, uh, um, I don't know, maybe, uh, oh gee, it's probably about, it, so if the lunar X is about one third up, there's another feature called the lunar V that would be two thirds up. Um, and it's similar. It looks like a V and it's very close to that terminator. And there are two similar features in that they don't actually, you know, exist as a standalone feature. It's just, they catch the sunlight at the right time and then they, uh, they create something to look at. And fun fact is that I was the second person to observe the lunar X. Well, there you go. So there's that. <laughs> yes. Yes. So get out there. Um, cause let me just see, uh, the next time, oh, you know what? October 23rd is another one, yeah. and it's 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and then December 21st is midnight. So uh, this is probably the most comfortable one to observe. October might be getting a little cold for, for some people. Some people in Saskatchewan. <laughs> yes, yes. So I got I to gotta tell the little story, though, about, about the Lunar X, me and the Lunar X. And that is that I was, I was observing at a star party and we decided to stay another night because one or two of the nights had been not, not very good maritimes again. And, uh, my friend Dave, um, was camped next to me and he and I observe quite a bit together and, and collaborate on a lot of projects together. And, uh, I like to usually go and sleep before I, before I observe, you know, this, this boat me as well. Sometimes I'll sleep past dark and then get up and I'm totally dark adapted and observe and, Anyway, Dave's got his telescope, little telescope, whatever it was. I think it might have been a 70 millimeter or something set up next to, uh, next to my tent, too close to my tent, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm trying to sleep and he's out there observing and kind of, and we're kind of chatting and I'm kind of saying, I kind of want to go to sleep now, Dave. And, and he's like, but wait, no, I got something here. There's this X on the moon. And I'm like, no, like, what do you No, I'm not getting out of bed. And he's like, Oh, you got to come see this. You got to come see this. So, and you know, this is about 15 or 16 years ago. So I get up and I wander out and I walk around and I look at this telescope and I'm like, great. There's an X on the moon. It's two craters back to back and wander back in and crawl in my back in my sleeping bag on my air mattress, go to sleep for a couple hours, get up and we observe the night. So he actually ends up writing this article I think it was in Sky News Magazine or in the, the RASC Journal. And then kind of, it started kind of getting picked up in a, you know, sort of popular astronomy literature after that. It turned out that, that some people had observed it before, but, but I don't know that anybody had called it the Lunar X or maybe they had and it kind of got carried forward in, into this. But nobody sort of had been recently 
uh, observing it in, in some time, although some people had reported, um, you know, the, the back-to-back illumination features. But uh, as far as like the popularization, it, it goes back to, to Dave. And so he, he ended up writing this, this article that was widely published. And, and I was reading it because I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I was sort of there for that. And, and I noticed that I was like cited in the article. Yeah, I was I'm reading thinking, it. You're you're listed as a contributor, <laughs> and I yes, and my contribution was literally, Dave. I just want to go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> just just be quiet, Dave. I'm tired. Exactly, exactly. That was my contribution. That I literally went out and looked at it because I wanted to go to. So, but I I confirmed the lunar X. So, <laughs> cool. If, if anybody is interested in that article, if you go to Wikipedia, uh, look, just do a search for lunar X. And one of the references, the, the third reference is Dave Chapman's article that Chris was just talking about. So. Yes. And I, I am unprominently featured in that article, but there <laughs> in the footnotes. <laughs> well, great. Well, that's good. We got a couple other things coming up, Shane. We got Sirius at Opposition on Friday the 28th, which is uh, a large asteroid. I think maybe even naked eye visibility. I think it's Ooh. into like sixth magnitude or something now. We have uh, on the 29th, a uh, week from yesterday, we have Jupiter just 1.4 degrees north of the moon. Um, and then later on that, that night, early morning, we have Saturn just two degrees north of the moon. So uh, next Saturday night, even if you don't have a telescope, um, great opportunity to go out and watch Jupiter and Saturn uh, going by the moon or the moon going by Jupiter than Saturn. Yeah, yeah. It's been a neat uh, a neat planetary season for all of these conjunctions uh, occurring, you know, um, pretty cool. Good stuff. Well, that's uh, sort of it for me for, for my update and, and what's going on. Do you have anything left to add for, uh, for episode 42, the answer to life, the universe and everything? <laughs> I have nothing else to add. Well, how can people get in touch with us and provide their own answers or questions? <laughs> uh, people can find us on Twitter uh, at actual astronomy People can email us, and I should probably check the account today. Uh, We are actualastronomy at gmail.com. And lastly, we are now on YouTube. Um, Nothing really visual, but you can listen to the podcast on YouTube. But the cool thing there is you can also leave comments, and we will read them and reply to them. Sounds good. And Shane, most of that is due to your hard work. I think it's all due to your hard work. So I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for... uh, for all the hard work that you do on the show. It's uh, really yeah. great. Well, I appreciate uh, you putting some notes together and making the chaos less chaotic. So. <laughs> I, I, if, you know what? It's the least I could do if there was anything less than I'd probably be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks everybody for listening.